Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. For the next few moments, I want to deal with epicenters for the apocalyptic countdown, five hot spots on earth at the time of the end. I want to give the introduction by saying this. The Old Testament prophets spoke about a time called the Day of the Lord. They described it as a time that would exist, that would be no other time like it since there was a nation, nor ever shall be. Daniel 12, 1 through 2, Jesus said, except the days be shortened, there would no flesh be saved. Matthew 24, 22. But what I would like to do is show you the main hot spots that will create triggers before the time and will also be the main hot spots at the time of the end. Now, when it comes to what's called the day of the Lord or the great day of the Lord, it's mentioned many times in the Old Testament prophets. But Zephaniah chapter 1, beginning at verse 14, said, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and it hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of waste and des desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The prophets of, of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, talk about the day of the Lord. Isaiah mentions it four times, Jeremiah mentions it one time, Joel mentions it five times, Amos two times, Zephaniah seven times, Zechariah one time, and also Malachi one time. The prophets, when you go to these references that speak about the day of the Lord, it gives you a very negative description. For example, it talks about punishment, darkness, gloom, vengeance, the Lord's anger, and a time of dread. In reality, I believe what some of the early fathers do, that there's a approximately 6,000 years of man's history representing the six days of creation and the seventh day God rested represents the 1,000 year millennial reign. However, the calendars are so mixed up, it's really difficult to tell when that 6,000 year time frame actually is. However, I can sum it up this way, that when the 6,000 years approximately is totally completed for man's rule on the earth, then what we're going to have is a period between the end of that time frame and the beginning of the kingdom of Christ on the earth, which is called, in the Bible, the day of the Lord. It's revealed in the book of Revelation, the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation called the apocalypse, and that word in Greek means the unveiling of something which is hidden, actually deal with this time called the day of the Lord. When John is on the Isle of Patmos as a political prisoner, one of the first things he says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the King James translation. Now what did John mean when he said in the Spirit on the Lord's day? There's only three things he could, it could have alluded to. Number one is, was it Sunday? Because we in the West call Sunday the Lord's Day? The answer is no, because really in reality in Mark 16, 2, Acts 20 and verse 7, and also 1 Corinthians 16 and 2, Sunday was known as in the New Testament the first day of the week. John would have said, and I was in the Spirit on the first day of the week, if he was alluding to the day Sunday. Well, <clears throat> your second choice is this. Was John talking about the Sabbath day? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, so was it Shabbat? And the answer would be again, no. Why? Because he would have addressed it with a different word. He would have talked about, I was in the Lord's day on the Sabbath day. Or in, 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 in the Hebrew, it's Shabbat, and it is actually the day where you cease from laboring. And in that day, of course, Saturday was considered Shabbat. So he wasn't talking about, I was in the Lord's day on Shabbat resting. But the phrase, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day is interesting because the Lord's day is, you ready? The day of the Lord. The day that these prophets talked about, and we would call it in the New Testament the tribulation. As a matter of fact, John is saying this, I was in the spirit or I was in the mind of God concerning the day of the Lord. And then he begins to describe these events that's going to happen in the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, if you go to the book of Revelation and you study it very carefully, you'll discover that there's over 600 direct or indirect references to something in the Old Testament, a verse, a word, a prediction. And if you continue to study it, you will discover that this day of the Lord, which is alluded to from Revelation chapter 4 all the way 
Exodus chapter 19 that the day of the Lord is a time frame that deals with what we call in the Bible the Great Tribulation. And it also, if you look at it very carefully, it is a summary of what all the Old Testament saw, oh, I'm sorry, the Old Testament prophets saw concerning this time called the day of the Lord. For example, Jeremiah tells you something. Isaiah says it's going to be dark. Another prophet says the moon doesn't give its light. Another prophet says the heavens depart like a scroll. And you read about it in the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is John through the Holy Spirit describing what the day of the Lord is like that all of the Old Testament prophets predicted in their prophecies. Now in the Old Testament, this is important you hear this, it is called the day of the Lord. In the New Testament it's called the tribulation. So in other words, the tribulation that you commonly hear spoken about by prophetic preachers and teachers is in reality the great day of the Lord that the Old Testament prophets talked about. Now the day of the Lord in many instances it's connected to shofars or trumpets and shofars and trumpets are used all throughout the Bible. Exodus 19 the, tr the shofar that Moses heard on Mount Sinai was linked to the very voice of God. De Joel chapter 2 the shofar that Joel talks about the trumpet are linked to judgments that are happening on the earth during the great day of the Lord. In the book of Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2 there are seven an angels blowing trumpets and releasing judgments on the earth. Once again, trumpets or shofars are related in these references to judgment. Matthew 24 and 31, there is a trumpet uh, that's connected to being sounded a great shofar in which the Lord gathers together his elect from the north, south, east, and west at the end of the tribulation period. Now John heard a voice in Revelation 4-1 like a trumpet and that trumpet voice said come up hither. P -p individuals such as myself that tend to believe in pre-trib believe that is referenced reference to the transition from the church age of chapter 2 and 3 to the coming of the Lord for the church in which John is caught up as believers will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now prophecy, prophecy in general is connected to what is called times and seasons in your Bible. And I'm going to tell you the ages that we're coming into. We could talk about ages past but that's not where we are. There are two ages. One is called ages present and the other is called ages to come. Now follow me carefully. Ages present is the church age, the dispensation of God distributing grace on the earth, but it's the season where Satan is in control of the world systems. That is this present age. But how many of you know there's an age to come? Hallelujah. And when you read about the age to come, it's the visible kingdom of God. Rewards are given at the judgment and that is where God rules. So this present age is ruled by evil and Satan and his henchmen and his principalities and powers. But in the ages to come, the saints and the holy angels will be ordered, will be actually ruling the entire cosm cosmic realm, the cosmos, first, second, and third heaven and we will actually one day have a new heaven and in the earth. Now here's where I want to go on this idea of the day of the Lord. There will be a time period, a time period between 24 to 48 hours in which five specific things are going to happen. And this will be at the conclusion of the great day of the Lord. At the end of the tribulation period, these five things will happen in 48 hours. Number one, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, the Bible says the Messiah will come to a place uh, that he will fight the battle alone and it's a place called Bozrah. It's a day of his vengeance, the Bible says. So the Lord is going to come back by himself into Israel, into the area of Petra and Bozrah to deliver a remnant. Revelation 19 11, it says, then he returns back to heaven to organize the armies of heaven who are then going to follow him on white horses. Immediately, Zechariah 14 and verse 4, the Lord comes back with the armies of heaven and they immediately go to the city of Jerusalem where they step on the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives splits in half and all that water underneath the mountain and under the Temple Mount will flow to the Mediterranean one way to the Dead Sea and heal the Dead Sea in the other direction. So that's number three. And then immediately an angel comes down from heaven with a chain and a key to the bottomless pit and lays hold on the devil and immediately casts him into the abyss for a thousand years. <laughs> I hope I'm standing close by to kick him one time real hard before he gets there.
In, fa in fact, maybe my kick will tip him into the pit. That's how I feel about it. Then number, f the next thing that happens is after the binding of Satan, Matthew 24 and 31, the Lord sounds the shofars and sends the angels to begin gathering his Jewish elect that have survived the tribulation from the four winds of heaven. Now imagine this. All of this is going to happen within about a 48-hour window. Now to get us to th through in into the great day of the Lord and to get us into the rule of Christ's kingdom, there has to be what I call epicenters. Epicenters where specific activity will happen. Let's call them epicenters. We can call them hot spots. So in this message, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through details of five hot spots that will be in the world at the time of the end. And when you see specific activity happening in these hot spots, it's an indicator of the very soon return of the Messiah for the church and for what we call the catching away of the saints, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Now, four out of five of these places are the cradle of civilization, meaning that if you go to Genesis chapter 2 and read about the rivers that were in the Garden of Eden, you have the Euphrates, you have the Hidekel, uh, what's, there's different words you can use, but you have the Euphrates River, you have the Pishon, the Gihon, and you have the Hidekel, which is the Tigris. Those rivers are in the area between Egypt all the way between the borders of Iraq and Iran. That's the cradle of civilization. So you're going to discover that the epicenter of activity in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel are going to center from four of five locations in what is called the cradle of civilization. Let us begin by talking about the first epicenter. There can be no question prophetically that the first epicenter of Bible prophecy is going to be the area of Syria. There are three main passages that I want to give to you about the country of Syria. Now already about 470,000 people have been killed in the Syrian civil war. That is as many people, ladies and gentlemen, as populates Oklahoma City or populates the city of New Orleans. Now imagine major city being wiped out. That's how many people in Syria have been killed in the Civil War, the past, actually from March uh, to 2011 to February 2016. Now let me give you three important scriptures. First is Isaiah chapter 17, 11. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The word heap in Hebrew translates a pile of rubbish. So Damascus will be destroyed to the point of becoming nothing but a pile of rubbish. The second passage is Jeremiah 49, verses 20. 24 through 27 from the New King James it reads, Damascus is grown feeble, she turns to, uh, to fell and fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrow have taken her like a woman in labor. Therefore her young men shall faint in the streets and all the men of war shall be cut off. Notice the men of war cut off. What's happening there now is war. War with ISIS. Uh, conflicts with the Kurds. With the government of uh, Assad. With the rebels. It's war all over the place. Then we read in Amos chapter 1 verses 3 through 5, I will break the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the plains of Avin. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity in Kir. K-I-R. In Kir. Now Avin, now these places actually exist. These are the old Older names, but we're going to kind of give you some of the newer areas. We have a Syrian refugee map here, as a matter of fact. Avin uh, is a valley in northeastern Lebanon, which is also called Baalbek, and it's also known as the Becca Valley. It's a very famous valley. Now, Kerr is a mountain region in western Jordan, country of Jordan. Now, in that vicinity, in all that area over there, uh, in the area of Jordan, for example, and all through the area where the Syrian refugees are, there's about one million four. 400,000 refugees that are in that part of the world, Syrian refugees that have been made refugees because of the civil war, the internal war happening in Syria. Now, Kerr is also located in what we call Moab. And so all of this ties in very well to biblical prophecy about the city of Damascus. Now, a question that I have is this. Why would ISIS want Syria? This question was asked at the prophetic summit to one of our speakers. Why would ISIS want Syria? And everybody here should know who ISIS is. Okay, first of all, ISIS wants Syria based on certain what we call Islamic prophecies or uh, apocalyptic Islamic prophecies. Muslims have two books that are considered sacred. One is the Quran and the other is called the Hadith. The Hadith are sayings and traditions that were passed down allegedly 
Muhammad said that were recorded later, he said this, he prayed this way, he ate this way, he spoke this way, he predicted this. So let's look at some of the hadith. The hadith teaches that there must be a caliphate. A caliphate is an Islamic state where states, Muslim states come together under one leader called the caliph. And so there must be a caliphate in, with Syria and Iraq. In other words, these two countries can no longer be Syria and Iraq. They have to come together as one to form this caliphate. And so the Muslims, the ISIS believes they are going to unite that part of the world, including Lebanon, under one caliphate and under one Islamic leader. Now, what is interesting as it connects to Damascus is this really unusual hadith about Damascus and Isa. Isa in the Quran is Jesus. We say Jesus, you say Yeshua in Hebrew, they say Isa. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. And Jesus the son of Mary, according to the Islamic Hadith is going to go to Damascus. And there when he arrives at Damascus, he will break the cross and kill the swine. The swine in that reference is a reference to Jewish people. And then he will tax those who are non-Muslims. Now all of this is in the Hadith and the uh, Muslims who are connected to ISIS, this is part of their teaching. The Hadith says this, and Jesus the son of Mary will descend near the white mosque toward east of Damascus. Now the white mosque is what the, what the oldest and one of the largest mosques in the world. It's the fourth holiest place in Islam. Now, Islam's holy places are Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, the Alaska Mosque, and, the, and on the Temple Mount. And this is the fourth one. You never hear the fourth one talked about, but in their prophecies, it's very significant. It's built in 634 after the Arab conquest of Damascus. It was a church up until the 6th century and was said to be the church of John the Baptist where the head or the skull of John the Baptist was. At one time, Damascus was the administrative capital for the Muslim world until 750 AD. In 2001, the Pope visited the White Mosque for the first time, and uh, there are three minarets. Now listen to this. There are three main minarets at the White Mosque, and one of them is called the Minaret of Isa, or the Minaret of Jesus. So they're teaching this, that it's important for you to understand this. How de Why is Damascus in the center? Why is Damascus controversial? Why does ISIS want Damascus? It all goes back to the prophecies. Because if you have the white mosque in your possession, then they believe it speeds up the appearance of Isa ibn Maryin, Jesus' son of uh, Mary, and it also speeds up the Mahdi who will help reform the caliphate. Does that make sense to everybody? So Damascus is important in their prophecies. Now the biggest battle, according to ISIS, is going to be in the northern Syrian city of Dabiq. We have a map picture of that for you there. And this is where there's a lot of fighting taking place right now in, uh, in the area of Syria in this particular area. Now, they have a prophecy. Again, in the Islamic Hadith, but they, some of the ISIS will take this literal. They are going to fight in this area till they pull the army of Rome. Now, the army of Rome, in the old days, some people would say, well, that refers to the Roman Empire. No, in the Hadiths, Rome represents the Christians. So when you read about Rome, it doesn't necessarily mean the Roman Empire or the city of Rome, Italy. It's translated by some Muslims to mean the Christians. So they're going to pull the army of Rome or the Christians into battle in this area in Dabiq, Syria. Now, check this out. There's wars in Syria. There's wars in, uh, there's trouble in Iran. There's all kinds of uh, conflict happening in Turkey. And so all of this ties in into this idea of two things. Now, now, now track with me for just a minute because I'm going to show you something, but this is important. If you go back, I was pretty, I'll just tell you where all this started. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana years ago, I was preaching at Christian Life Fellowship and something very unusual happened. I was preaching on Revelation 13 and I pointed out one night, Revelation 13, 1 through 2, a military man called the Antichrist called the Beast. And I told that he would come out of the Middle East and the countries that represented by the symbolism in Revelation 13. The next night I preached on the false prophet. Revelation 13, 11 through 18. And I talked about how he's a lamb with two horns. He's not really rep does not represent real Christianity. It represents a false religion. Two religions coming together as one. When the service was over, a young girl named Ellie, as she made me watching her telecast here in Baton Rouge, she called, she came up to me and she says, have you heard about the Islamic Mahdi? I said, no. So she began to explain to me, she says, tonight when you said that 
a person is coming who will be probably an Islamic leader and they will be followed by someone who claims to be Jesus. She says, that's what I was taught in Iran. That's what we're taught. I said, you got to be kidding me. I never knew this. I never knew of the Hadith. I didn't know it taught any of these things. And so she, we went over to our house where we were staying for two nights in a row after church. We sat at the kitchen table and she taught me six hours. If I remember right, I mean, it was way into the uh, morning. She taught me two days in a row about everything that the, the fanatical uh, Islamic uh, individuals who are like ISIS believe about the last days. And I was stunned because I'm telling you, the, the Mahdi comes on a white horse. That's in Revelation 6. The Mahdi beheads people who do not accept his ideas. That's in Revelation chapter 20. Souls are beheaded. for the. Wait a minute. You ready? The Mahdi makes a peace treaty for seven years. Are you listening? That's the seven year. Daniel chapter 9, 27. The girl just blew my mind. And so that's why in 1996, I wrote a book called Unleashing the Beast that became a bestseller because I wanted people to hear how all of this that was happening. Now, folks, this is before 9-11. This is before the war on terror. This is before Al-Qaeda and ISIS. This is before a man named bin Laden. And I began to predict by the Holy Spirit, based on the Word, things that have now began to happen. Somebody say, praise God, the Spirit of God knows these things. He really does. Amen. Please give me your undivided attention. I have in my hands what is the most significant prophetic word of 2016, and I want to make it available to you. The message is from the International Prophetic Summit with myself, Bill Cloud, Jonathan Kahn, and Mark Biltz. I want to give you some of the titles of what you will hear when you receive the CDs or DVDs. I preached a message called The Return of the Babylonian Spirits Controlling America's Politics. I preached a second message, and this is a very powerful, important message called The Five Epicenters of the Apocalyptic Countdown. Where are the five centers of where all activity will be happening at the time of the end, including the United States of of America. One message that it seemed people enjoyed immensely was Jewish festivals concealed in our last year in heaven. You will discover the last year in heaven and its parallels to the festivals of Israel and how the festivals of Israel are actually concealed in the apocalypse. Another message I preached was America, the preview of our end game. And this is where I found the notes of my father that I've looked for for eight years where an angel of God visited him, showing him something that would happen to America in the future. He wouldn't talk about it much publicly, but I felt led to share it with the people during this service and in this conference. Mark Biltz preached on God's Daytimer. He preached a second message called Solomon, a type of Messiah or anti-Messiah. And then Bill Cloud came along and preached on warning, the locusts are coming. Bill preached a second message called It's Open Season on Believers and a third message included in our CD and DVD series, And You Shall Know, Entering the Age of the Messiah. Jonathan Kahn preached on the Shemitah template and began to show us how things were happening related to the Shemitah cycle and what will come in the near future. Now, there are 10 CDs or 10 DVDs in the albums. The CDs are $65 a set. The DVDs are $110 a set for, for your donation of that or more. And the CD offer numbers on the screen 16 PS CD the DVD offer is 16 PS DVD you can order online at perrystone.org you can call our office or the 888 21 bread number or perrystone PO box 3595 Cleveland Tennessee 37320 this series from the international summit is for those who want to know and desire to stay informed concerning the word of the Lord for these times and seasons once again CDs and DVDs unedited, uncut. On TV, you only see about 22-minute clip. These are messages that are 60 to 70 minutes long. I want you to hear the entire message that I preach and not just a clip because the main meat of the message is later on into it and we have to edit certain things out of the television program. Get the unedited version right now of our CDs and DVDs. We're looking forward to hearing from you today. I hope you enjoy the excerpt from the International Prophetic Summit that was at OCI. Mark Biltz, Jonathan Kahn, myself, and Bill Cloud, and the CDs and DVDs are being made available to you. Now, this is important you understand this, that when you watch it on Manifest, you get it's edited, and uh, we only have so many minutes to do it. 
However, when you get the CDs and DVDs, we do the unedited, uncut version. You get everything as it was at the conference. So please order those now. It helps keep Manifest on the air in your area. Directly behind me, by the way, you see a screen. And this is a live feed coming to you from Omega Center International at our small hall where we have had the International School of the Word Mentoring for Business, Ministry, and Leadership hosted by myself and Dr. Brian Cutshaw. The International School of the Word is going to be launched in the month of January of this next year, and it's going to be an internet Bible school, and we are not going to say a lot about it now, but we're going to have websites up in the future. We're going to be announcing this in the future and launching it. We're working on the curriculum. We're working with professors. We're working with taping it now and getting it all ready, hopefully, to launch by next year. This means that if you're uh, in the United States, Canada, Latin America, or anywhere in the world, and you have access to the internet, that you you could be a part of logging on and being educated through this school of ministry. So anyway, we're excited about what God's going to do. We're excited also that the uh, New Testament commentary, which is a 300,000 word commentary that I personally put together of the New Testament, is about to be put together in Bible form. We're going to have the New Testament with the commentary. That's going to be made available in January as well. So folks, listen to me. So much is going on. And if you're a partner of our ministry, you've made it possible. Now, speaking of partners, don't forget, in the month of June, we have that nine service, five day conference here, Partners Homecoming. And remember this, it's my 40th year of preaching. I started preaching at age 16, I'm 56. 40 years in the month of June will be my 40th anniversary. We've got some crazy stuff planned. So partners, don't you dare miss the Partners Homecoming. If you've never been, plan on coming. If you've been before, don't miss it. And then the Louisville, of course, Louisville, Kentucky, is our main Hebraic prophetic summit that's going to be taking place in the month of July at the Biltown Road Evangel World Press Center. We've been there about 15 times. It packs out to capacity. People are blessed, saved, healed, and touched. And I'm going to be there Thursday night all the way through two services on Friday, Saturday, and also on Sunday. So don't miss that. Now, one more thing I've got to share with you. The Release the Roar event in Northern Ohio is just about full. So get your youth there registered at OCIministries.org. And don't forget the Reformation gathering of young people here at OCI. The big summer event. It's like a warrior fest. The big summer event in July at OCI for young people. Pastors, bring your youth group. I have a burden for rural churches. My daddy pastored many rural churches when I was younger, and I have a burden for those churches. So I want you to come and bring your youth group to this meeting in the month of July. Let's look. Our meetings, there's no fee to attend. Uh, all we ask you to do is register at OCIministries.org, your group's name, so that we can prepare for you when you get here. So please bring young people who are bound, addicted, depressed, oppressed, or young people who just are on fire for God and want more fire. It's not just about ministering to those with needs. It's about seeing your youth group fired up for God. Man, do we have the testimonies of how God has changed the life of thousands of young people, and we give Him all the praise and all the glory. Now, don't forget, go to perrystone.org, perrystoneministries.org or perrystone.org. Uh, follow us on all the different social media that's out there. But if you want to know about our itinerary, you want to join us in our other meetings this fall and throughout the year, do that, and we'll be talking to you somewhere down the road, I'm sure. God bless you. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2016 Israel tour. The dates are November 21st through the 30th with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. For more information and how to register, call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org. Seating is limited, so call today.